With us now moving into the next arc, episode 48 skips the opening sequence and moves right into the title, Bystander, of course referring to Keith. But as per usual, I think there are a number of more complex ways to interpret the title. Firstly, just like Kenny talked about in the last episode, every single person is a slave to something. They come up with some arbitrary goals and values to pursue and that is what makes them, them. So from that perspective, Keith is as much of a bystander as Grisha. He is a bystander in Grisha's story, but Grisha is a bystander in his. There are no special ones. All there is are people convincing themselves that some goals and ideas are more worthy than others. Which naturally feeds into numero two, the complete opposite perspective. Carl is saying that life as a whole is special. There don't have to be any chosen ones for there to be special ones. If nothing matters and everyone spends their life drunk on something, well then nothing matters, including any of these grand pursuits of freedom, right? As with everything in AOT, it is all about perspective and these perceived values. Plenty more on this throughout the episode. Moving into the story itself, we open with Astoria chasing around a bunch of kids, while Armin and John just joke about how she doesn't seem like much of a queen. I think this again just reinforces that point of Astoria breaking the cycle. She is the queen, but instead of just setting herself up for a comfortable life just like the Council of Dinosaurs, she does everything in her power to genuinely help the people of the Walls. And of course, we later see those lines of status blurred even further as she marries that farm lad. And speaking of the farm lad, in the context of this episode, it also reinforces that just a bystander and no one is special angle. The concept of a king and queen is entirely made up. In the world of Attack on Titan, their blood does actually have special properties. But on like a conceptual level, nothing about them is in any way special, right? There is a reason why so many people bought into this fake king angle, because there is nothing special about him. He can be a fake and no one knows about it. And so, Historia puts herself on the same exact level as just a bunch of kids. And for her, we of course know that this is incredibly meaningful because of Frida. Historia's mother was nearby, but for all intents and purposes, she was an orphan. And so, in a roundabout way, she becomes that loving mother she read about in the stories. She gives these orphans a sort of a Frida of their own. We also get a whole bunch of exposition speech, with them noting that it's been two months since she was crowned. Considering the ending of season two, and the ending of you know, literally the previous episode, two months of quiet should very much raise some red flags for you. More on that in a second. But with the benefit of hindsight, what I find most amusing here is how Aaron is deliberately kept out of sight for this entire little opening bit. What you might notice is that this is their meeting spot in the final season. Aaron is wearing a very similar black hoodie type of thing. Historia 2 is wearing extremely similar clothes, and of course, compared to Jean and Armin, Aaron is already pretty miserable. And in the long run, just like we don't see him join in the conversation here, he'd also stand alone. When we actually get to Aaron though, he also does a big ol' lore dump. Saying that right after Historia became queen, she got all the kids out of the underground and brought them here, with even Levi backing her since he too came from the underground. Practically speaking, it is just exposition. But big picture-wise, I think this is Aaron seeing the person in whose hands he could leave parody. He quite literally says that Historia believes she must help people no matter who or where they are. Historia is the type of person Aaron not just wants, but kind of needs to look after his friends. So eventually, her survival becomes paramount because without her, the friends he wishes to protect would be persecuted by his remaining loyalists. So in a sense, she is almost the most important. And with that in mind, note how the music goes from this warm and wholesome tune at the start of the sequence to this oddly cold one as Aaron explains his thoughts. <laughs> Though continuing on that story and Aaron thread, we then see them briefly talk about everything going on. And here, I think it's important to note how their relationship has already developed. At the start of the season, we already saw how the loss of Amir, the whole Titan craziness, and both of them finding out truths about themselves had really solidified the bond between them. But after the events of the Crystal Catacombs and their memories quite literally being intertwined, I think that bond has become infinitely stronger. Both of them are now shrouded in this entirely new fog of uncertainty. Mikasa and Armin are still clearly the absolute closest to Eren, but I think Astoria is the person who Eren can truly confide in. This may totally be just a me thing, but there are things I don't tell to my absolute closest friends, but do to someone I am not that close with, but we share a similar experience or something like that. 
In other words, Istoria is the only person who can really relate to Eren's experience of these manipulated memories. So it's kind of just a case of no one else even being able to forge such a bond. In the long run, on the other hand, we do see a slightly different version of this with Eren and Reiner, and to a lesser extent, Armin, Bertolt, and even Annie. There's no time for that. More on that soon, TM. Also continuing to set up the next arc, Eren talks a bunch about practicing the hardening, saying he must make sure that he gets it before those two come back. Those two, of course, being Ryan, Eren, and Burrito. Though most importantly, this entire season has been about recontextualizing the conflict as always having been human. And so Eren doesn't talk about learning the truth or why this might have happened. Rather, as the music cuts out, he simply says, We are long past the point of doubting the severity of these human threats. Regardless of how much Eren might have looked up to Reiner, he's under no delusions of talking things out or whatever else. Just like Rod, they mean to capture him and feed him to someone. Eren's only bit of leverage is the fact that they need him alive while he does not necessarily need the same of them. Though Astoria then says that she hopes they find out soon why the world is the way it is, then just saying she doesn't want them to have to regret the things they've done. Much like their conversations in the Crystal Catacombs, this is another one you can just transpose right into their final season conversation and it makes perfect sense. Eventually, Eren would once again be talking about having to be ready and having to kill them, while Astoria talks about the hope of learning about the world. It's again that angle of the Founding Titan representing those two sides of a generation. One side is burdened by the sins of the past, but the other strives for freedom and for happiness. But okay, Mikas so stepping up with that dead stare and breaking them up is just perfect. We then get another mini Lord them from Armin about the aftermath of the coup d'etat. Just like I said with the whole Rod Rice plan, these little follow-ups of what actually happened next were always one of my favorite bits of Attack on Titan. I think it's just a cool, realistic take on the true repercussions of what they were doing. The coup d'etat worked in our favor, sure, but that doesn't magically solve all problems. There could still be opposition, there could still be people denying Historia's legitimacy and so on. So while it is brief, even just the mention that it wasn't as simple as, oh, plan worked, GG's, we move on, is already deserving of a big old gold star in my book. And on a similar note, we hear of all the technological progress that came from the glowing crystals. Exactly as with magically solving very large scale issues, technological progress is also something I feel like a lot of stories struggle with for the simple reason of it often being too simple of a solution. Think of like the guts trick in The Walking Dead. Purely from a realism sense, obviously there's risk of bacteria, it's very stinky, etc. But from that same realism sense, the tactic would have made a number of things a whole lot more easier. But even so, the strategy is very rarely employed because from a filmmaking perspective, you'd be retreading the same ground. Same for Game of Thrones and the Scorpion Bolts. They work very, very well, and suddenly, they no longer work because, um, D&D kind of, you know, forgot, I guess? So whenever these kinds of developments are actually followed through, I think it's really neat attention to detail. And the same goes for Aaron's hardening. We already heard that he's been practicing, but that practice has also yielded a positive externality of sorts in this weird guillotine thingy. Though we also see that transforming too many times in rapid succession begins to take a toll on Eren's human body. Under normal circumstances, Titan shifters heal, and if they are too exhausted to transform, their Titan forms just don't develop properly. But here, we see that Eren himself begins to bleed. Considering Eren is just about the only one we see capable of transforming multiple times in rapid succession, the fact that the Titan powers themselves are activated by survival instinct, and the fact that Eren is the Founding Titan, I think this is literally just the meme of I'm tired, boss. As in, the passage of time is massively warped within the paths, but Emir still has to reconstruct their bodies over and over. So if Eren transforms over and over, that's just pushing Emir's capabilities to their limits. At that point, it's no longer about healing Eren, it's about even his human body beginning to degrade. But as I always say, magic is magic and magic is cool. As much as I talk about it, it doesn't need a whole lore explanation. It could easily be just Eren's exhaustion, pure and simple. Still interesting to think about though. We then cut on over to the canteen, where we see the return of everyone's favorite mob cosplayer, as well as a whole bunch of totally new recruits who are all very, very excited about joining the scouts. We of course see some good old bands with Sasha and Connie teasing Mob about being absolutely clueless about the fact that Hitch clearly cares for him. But we all know what show this is, so we know how this ends. Though Jean then talks about how the only ones excited about this whole ordeal are the recruits with zero experience. 
And okay, real quick, very serious talk for a moment. Am I the only one who was extremely bothered by Flock's hair? Like, seriously, to an unreasonable degree? Why does he have an extra tornado on top of his hair? It looks so dumb, I hate it. If we had the budget, I'd get someone to edit in a massive sensor bar just over his head because I seriously hate it that much, it's so ugly. Flock's excruciatingly annoying hair aside, this whole, yeah, let's go, we're taking back Wal Maria perspective is a really interesting talking point. In a somewhat roundabout way, the scouts remove the false king and reveal the truth. But it's through these quote-unquote heroic actions that the scouts themselves are sort of producing propaganda, especially with the very public display of Aaron's Titan. With his squad, Erwin's speech was less so recruitment, more so scaring everyone away because he was still sussing out traitors. So there, everyone was perhaps a little too familiar with exactly what they were getting into. But now that Eren has been paraded as humanity's savior, Historia has been revealed as their rightful queen, the two geniuses Erwin and Hanji are creating new technologies and whatnot, the public narrative has kind of flipped entirely. And while they are obviously not trying to be deceptive or malicious, in the long run, we'd see exactly how these inflated views of chosen ones and borderline delusional patriotism would turn Flock into something real real bad. If Eren's drive for freedom was this pure cause that was just corrupted and tainted by the cruelty of the world, then Flock's was already a constructed facade where they are some chosen liberators who can do no wrong. But okay, let's not jump ahead. Connie says that he's going to bed early, saying he's going back to Rogco to see if they can find something new. And Sasha also briefly wonders whether Connie's mom would ever turn back to normal. Again, a small detail that doesn't really change much right now, but I like that these personal little stories are also followed up with. Especially because of what we see next, with us then zipping through a bunch of flashbacks where Connie and Levi share the conclusion they arrived to of all Titans being human. And of course, we get the usual super scratchy spooky music. <laughs> but Aaron then says, a nightmare, huh? We haven't had much time to worry about it lately, but... Who exactly have we been fighting? Aren't Titans basically just innocent people trapped in some unending nightmare? And ho oh boy, is there a ton to unpack here. First off, from a purely TV show perspective I guess, much like Aaron himself says, if you were just following the series beat by beat, you also wouldn't have really lingered on the fact that, yes, all people are indeed Titans. We learned of that back in Season 2, but with how Season 3 shaped out, we haven't ever really had the time to take in what that means and how many people they had slain. I assume many of you will also know people who just completely forgot about the little fact that there are titans within the walls, for example. The show deliberately doesn't focus on it, and so it's not really at the top of your mind. And by extension, the natural question that arises is, well, if they are just innocent people, then who are we even fighting? It is a very simple question that many people could have easily arrived to a long time ago. But for those people who, just like the characters in-universe, were just kind of caught up in the action, this is the point where it really makes you ask whether the world we knew is actually the world. Even if you do connect the dots of all titans are people, therefore we have been fighting people, you might not have then asked the follow-up of, well okay, what stands behind these people? Though from an overanalyzing perspective, much like at the start of the episode and Aaron being awfully quiet, here too you might notice that he does kind of stunlock everyone around him, and based on everything he says here, I am fairly convinced that this is a result of all kinds of memories bleeding through. What I mean by that is Aaron talks about how these innocent people are stuck in a never-ending nightmare. Sound familiar? That's him. And when we cut to the end of the season, they stop by the Crawling Titan and Eren is the one who shows deep compassion, because they are one and the same, both trapped in a nightmare against their will. So if Flock just established that theme of good things becoming twisted, then Eren is now recontextualizing the horrible Titans to just innocent people. And on that note, Jean says all Eren's been doing lately is just sad mumbling, saying he should focus a bit more on the guy he saw in his memories. The reason why he is sad mumbling is because his head is already a little jumbled up. Something we see again with Armin asking, was it your memories or was it your dad? Only for Aaron to mumble, me, I think. When it comes to these memory shenanigans, it's basically impossible to really convey what Aaron's state of mind is, as, well, you know, normally you wouldn't have experiences of living inside another person's head. But point is, he literally cannot distinguish between himself and Grisha, and this is not even his final form. 
Though Jean being Jean, he teases Aaron about how he should stop holding hands with Astoria and get a headbutt from that Commandant instead. Considering all the Mikasa jealousy jokes this episode, this could just be Jean adding fuel to the fire. But maybe Pad's- okay, no. No. Pad's Aaron is not controlling Jean. He just mentioned the dude so Aaron remembered him. It's really not that deep. But maybe- okay, no, 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 no. My ha ha funny goofies aside. To me, this was always one of those super practical scenes of quickly moving the story along that did sort of break the illusion a little. It's just a little too convenient. Obviously, this is a tiny nitpick that changes nothing. I mean, I doubt people would have found 30 minutes of them sitting around and just throwing out names very engaging, right? But this is overanalyzing, so I am legally obliged to mention it. Though Aaron remembering that it had in fact been Keith, we set off to where it all began. Their very own training camp. Like we talked about last time with Rod mirroring the fall of Shiganshina, I think meeting Keith here is meant to mirror their original training arc. And I think Return to Shiganshina later is mirroring Trost, the attack on the Barrio mirroring the Titans clashing arc, and eventually, I think the rumbling mirrors the finale of Season 2 where we lose Amir. Yes, in this case, actually both Amirs. More on the rest of those later, but here, Keith himself would explicitly say that he doesn't even recognize them anymore. They are no longer the goofy kids getting into fights and whatnots. In just a handful of months, they've become very cold and distant. But before we pick back up with our mystery man, we jump on over to the mid-card where we see the very menacingly named Executioner from Hell. Personally, I would have gone for something a bit more creative, like Mjolnir's Hammer or Titan's Judgments or something like that, but okay, yours works too, I guess. I think I babbled on about the technological angle last time, so I won't get into that again. Definitely a cool little bit of extra lore, though. Returning to the episode, right away we open with a callback to their training, with Keith asking whether Sasha's going to take a seat, only for her to scream out that she is perfectly happy standing. This is of course in reference to the very famous, or I guess infamous, potato incident that left her running laps right up until she dropped. But without too much preamble, Keith says that Aaron looks exactly like his mother, minus the eyes. Those daggers are definitely his father's. Again, I think this brings me back to that duality of the Founding Titan. Especially because eyes, both in Attack on Titan as well as in general, are meant to convey the mental states and the true intentions of a person. He may look as pure as his mother, but his eyes hold the hatred of his father. And with Aaron, it's actually true twofold. While he may look like his mom now, what you might notice is that Grisha's and Aaron's looks over the course of their lifetimes are also exactly the same. They start out with that typical haircut of like a cut in the middle, but eventually both have long swept back hair. And if you're feeling particularly spicy, you could even say that Yuri's hair is straight up early days Aaron. Like, literally the same. It's just Aaron's hair, but like white. He then goes on to say that the only thing he can impart is a story of no importance to humanity. And yeah, I guess I must have missed it because apparently it's opposite day today. Because old Keith here is about to drop a very respectable lore drop that is anything but irrelevant. But importantly, this is where that bystander angle is formally introduced, with him basically talking as if he was a side character in this entire story that is life. He then says that 20 years ago at Walmaria, Grisha, and let's hit the pause button right there, because 20 years, the math does not math. We are currently in the year 850. Maria fell in 845. So, five years ago, and that's exactly when Grisha joined the founder and gave both it and the attack titan to Aaron. If you manage to pass your preschool math exam, you'll probably notice that this implies Grisha held the Attack Titan for at least 15 years. Which, you know, should be impossible due to the curse of Amir. That of course being the death of the Titan Shifter 13 years after they get their Titan. So, you could say that we have a sort of a pseudo plot hole. That said, I think it's important to remember that this is a retelling, so he could easily just round it up to 20 years. It's simple, it's realistic, and it makes sense. Whether it's 17, 18, 20 years ago, it really doesn't change much in the grand scheme of things. I mean, when was 2018? Two years ago, right? Though numero two, an alternate interpretation I would offer up is that we don't really know how the Curse of Amir works. As in, perhaps it's not exactly 13 years. Maybe Amir knew that leap years would make it very confusing and sort of unfair. So instead, maybe she decided that your health would just begin to rapidly degrade after the 13th year. Perhaps that is why Grisha started to wear the glasses. Perhaps his vision was the first thing to go. Same goes for Yuri using the cane. Point being that, it is such a minor detail that no matter how you swing it, personally, I don't think it's a plot hole and can be explained away in a number of different ways. 
I just don't see something as basic of a thing as this slipping through and becoming a plot hole. Getting to his actual story though, he says that one day, Grisha just popped up out of the blue and said that he had no idea how he even got outside of the walls. Number one, this shot is just really, really cool. And yes, Grisha is standing under a tree. Big foreshadowing. But number two, it continues to explore the question of perspective when it comes to all of these stories. Even with a tiny interaction like this. For Keith, Grisha is a random NPC who somehow appeared and very quickly became renowned within the walls. For Grisha, on the other hand, absolutely everything he sees on Parody is, well, firstly, incredibly rudimental, but even more so, completely alien. But importantly, we as the audience don't know Grisha's side of the story just yet. Just like we also don't know the Marley Squad's side of the story. Everything here is about perspective, and in this case, we are the bystander. And speaking of these perspectives, after Grisha is initially detained, Ponish just wants to go with the flow, saying he hasn't done anything and they'll just let him go. And that is when we see them standing atop the HQ and looking out at Shiganshina. The story we follow begins with Aaron and Armin dreaming of what lies beyond the wall, beyond this cage, of reaching the sea and of flying free in freedom. But for Grisha, that freedom is within these walls. Think I'm going to have to start like a perspective mention counter, but yes, you are always a villain, you are always a hero, and always just a bystander in someone else's story. We then pop on over to the bar, where Grisha surmised that the walls are certainly not perfect, with things like economic inequality still existing, but that generally, things are peaceful. Coming from Marley, peace is of course much more important than economic equality. But Keith fires back saying that people just drink their lives away, not even wondering what's beyond the horizon, which, again, perspective. Later, he'd contextualize himself as the bystander in Grisha's story. But in the way he speaks here, it's like he considers his pursuits as more worthy. AKA, he views himself as almost like the main character, surrounded by other bystanders. More on that in a second. But Grisha just plainly asks, so that's what the scouts do? Explore beyond the walls? And while Keith expects Grisha to laugh at him, Grisha just suddenly says that, yes, they are the wisest of the walls and that they symbolize humanity's desire for freedom. Firstly, yes, I absolutely think these are Attack Titan memories just bleeding through. But numero two, remember that he was also a Eldia Restorationist. We of course don't know exactly how many of his memories were affected by him eating the owl, same as we never find out which memories did Amir lose, and also sort of Eren. But I don't think it's too wild to assume that everything he says here might almost be a pitch to what he wants to do next. Perhaps this pursuit of freedom in the scouts might be a great vehicle to restore Eldia and ensure the safety of Eldians. Yes, we are still talking about Grisha. And if you want to take that perspective idea even further, Carla then walks up telling Keith that he can't be recruiting for scouts again, only for Grisha to joke that he could never and that that is for someone destined for greatness. So, if both of them were just trying to pseudo-recruit each other for some greater cause, both of them are just bystanders in Aaron's story, right? But this whole destined for greatness thing absolutely shook Keith and he genuinely began to believe that he was the chosen one. And just like that, we loop back to episode 1 and Aaron's long dream. So, like I said, I think there is definitely an argument to be made that a lot of what Grisha slash Aaron says here is deliberately meant to sway Keith and, more importantly, the scouts in certain directions. In the same way Aaron played Mikasa, he could very well be playing Keith. He's already ensured the survival of his two needed Ackermans. So now, maybe he needs to push the scouts into overdrive. And we of course also see that Keith has a pretty big crush on Carla, but you know, you win some, you lose some Keith. Though another interesting thing that we see here is the whole sickness that happens. The simple explanation for Grisha's seemingly magical medical abilities is just because Marley's knowledge was infinitely more advanced. If he was knowledgeable by Marley's standards, well, then this is probably high school basics to him. He might not have the advanced equipments, but compared to everyone else, he probably does seem like a bit of a wizard. But in the wider lore, there's also a mildly amusing coincidence in the fact that we know of how 600 years ago, the Founding Titan altered the Eldians' bodies to sort of cure them from some disease. So while Grisha doesn't have the Founding Titan yet, we still have this bizarre cyclicality of him eventually doing the same thing. Two nickels and all that. But what is easily the most beautiful thing here is the transition we get between Keith and Grisha. Inspired by Grisha's words, Keith fought for his dream and he reached it. He became the commander, but he still stood alone, never noticed or valued by anyone. Only for us to then fade to him standing in an entire crowd watching Grisha's wedding. Even colors-wise, he's the black swan. And even in his commander role, we see him fail. 
this is that moment where his delusions of grandeur truly crumble down. Because to him, he is no longer just a scout commander who was defeated on a dangerous mission. Rather, he is now the quote-unquote chosen one who failed. It's not a matter of ability, but one of expectation and these endless comparisons to someone else. Something we'd also see with the very annoying hairhead man Flock. Only with Keith, that doesn't come with some hatred for the world or Grisha or anyone else really, but rather himself. And on that note, we get to one of the many greats of Season 3. The Keith and Carla sequence. First off, knowing how the story ends, seeing Aaron as this cute little baby obviously has that weird uncomfortable vibe to it in the same way you read like a history book and see a young version of, well, I'm sure you can think of someone. But Carl then just asks if he really means to keep doing this right up until he dies. But Keith just screams that these people live their entire lives without accomplishing a single thing, completely ignorant of the bigger world. And suddenly, Keith is the one evoking Aaron's story despite being that quote-unquote bystander, right? He realizes the futility of this world, he realizes that he is not special, but he keeps moving forward even if everyone around him ends up dead. He hates anyone who wishes to hold him back, he hated their cage, and he hated himself. But just like the non-founding titan Aaron just wanted to be rid of it all, he too gives up command to Erwin because he believes that he is not important to the story. And the visuals here of him saying, special people do exist but I was never a part of them, is absolutely excellent. With a storm of people all around him quite literally showing us that he is just a face in the crowd. But importantly, Grisha too is in that same crowd. And the music here is also just stellar. <laughs> and like the bystanders that we are, we finally learn of the final piece in the puzzle. We first saw Aaron magically wake up with a key. We then learned that he got the key from his dad, who he ate. And now we learn that there was another bystander. One who wanted to help in whatever way he could, but Risha was supposedly the chosen one, and so he did nothing. And yes, the music here is once again just perfect. And man, Keith's line of, are you really going to curse someone else like this, cuts real deep. Because this is Keith finally vocalizing that hatred he felt for himself and I think projecting it onto Grisha. I think what he's referring to are those expectations of being the quote-unquote chosen one. Expectations we saw destroy his life. It was Grisha's words that made him think that it is him. But now, Grisha is telling that to his son. But Grisha cuts back saying, he is nothing like you. Keep in mind that this Grisha has already been in the Crystal Catacombs. He knows full well that all of this is Aaron's doing. Aaron is nothing like Keith because he is the one who made Grisha quote-unquote special. And so, he just saw distant thunder, that of course being Aaron transforming, and carried back his body to where we saw him all the way back in episode 2. And note the glitching sound effect as the flashback comes to a close and the Founding Titan is passed on. And that... And because this question will probably pop up, shouldn't have Keith noticed the similarities to that quote-unquote thunder once more titans begun to sprung up a few years later? Well, I'm going to go with Occam's razor and just assume that he didn't see it clearly nor for long enough to really make any judgments and this happened years ago and he was in a pretty bad headspace. I don't think he's a galaxy brain who knew Aaron had a titan years in advance or anything. He clearly suspected something considering that Grisha was just gone but I don't think he ever really connected any of the dots. Mainly because there were no dots to connect. Though as we return to the present day, Hanji blurts out that at least now they know why he resigned, basically saying, boo hoo, you realize you're not some special boy and left. Very noble. But Aaron immediately cuts them off, saying he too knows that he's not special. He's just a son of a special man. So again, it's all of these people saying that someone else is special and that they are just a bystander. And again, is that duality of the Founding Titan. Him being the son of this quote-unquote special man is that hatred that he has inherited. And because this episode cooked particularly hard, this is also one that drifts right into the ED. We see that Aaron's words really hit a nerve for old Keith. And so, we go back to his conversation with Carla, who just casually says, Is it wrong not to be special? I certainly don't think so. If my child isn't special, if he never does anything great, so what? He doesn't have to be better than anyone. I mean, look at him. He's so cute already. He's more than special enough for me. He's special because he was born into this world. 
I think this line is easily up there with the best of Attack on Titan and is also a perfect book into this episode. Attack on Titan usually explores the more nihilistic side of things. Endless blind cycles of hatred, betrayal, sacrifice, even the lack of free will. But I think it's lines like this that immediately ground us. Because what makes something special is you. If nothing matters, then the only thing that matters to you is the thing you decide to make special. So in this cold and bleak world, to Carla, Aaron is more than special enough and no one can ever take that away from her. And while we talk about it in the context of AOT, I think the sentiment is one we particularly lack nowadays in the real world as well. Feels like there are a whole lot of Keiths always comparing themselves to a Grisha without ever knowing the full picture. You know, like the little fact that he has literally lost his marbles already. Carla's words here obviously ring more than a little different with how the story ends. But the sentiment of making things special I think is beautiful. I'm going to turn into a YouTube self-help guru real quick, but unless you're doing something like really really weird, never let anyone tell you that your hobbies or interests or even job is any less meaningful than someone else. It's special to you, and in a world where nothing matters and both of you are just space dust, who cares if that bystander has main character syndrome, am I right? But as much as the line is very wholesome and beautiful, this is still Attack on Titan. So the speech actually concludes with, And you did just as your father wanted. The fire you lit in your hearts will no doubt burn you to ashes outside the walls. Remember the whole, you look like your mother, minus the eyes? And remember, if I lose it all outside the walls? Yep, this is that duality of the Founding Titan. Aaron is just an innocent boy with his own hopes and dreams. But he is also the hatred of an entire nation. One who will surely burn. And of course, we also go full circle with Keith trying to sabotage Aaron's gear in an attempt to protect him. But even so, he persevered. I have seen some people interpret this as him trying to sabotage it to sort of spite Grisha. But personally, I rather viewed it as him honoring Carla's wishes and not letting her special little boy get those daggers in his eyes. But again, this is Attack on Titan, so Keith then drops the line of, I tried, but could not change a single thing. The man who ate himself up for not being quote unquote special enough says the same line as the literal godlike being. Both of them are bystanders, and both of them are in absolutely no way special. The world is a cruel and meaningless place, but to Carla, without a doubt, both of them were very, very special. And on that very bittersweet note, this is where we'll pick up next time. Easily one of my favorite episodes of Season 3, and a classic case of the series dropping one of the most engaging episodes with zero action whatsoever. Just some good old mystery and a stark emotional contrast to slam you right in the feels. Like, seriously, with how dark the series usually is, Carla's line about Aaron already being special is one that just always gets me. Usually stories have these peaks and valleys in terms of tone, but with a series like Berserk and Attack on Titan, it very much feels like the tone just becomes darker and darker and darker. So whenever you get these tiny moments of hope, they are just super powerful. But anyway, we're right back to very long solo episodes, and next time we're setting off for Shiganshina. So, I hope to see you back as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. Yes, before you ask, I will talk plenty about Zeke's euthanasia plan and how it obviously opposes Carla's perspective. There's a whole bunch to talk about how he sort of opposes Grisha, but sort of also becomes Grisha, but I just didn't want to jam all of that here, as I think it's going to make a whole lot more sense later on. But yes, fret not, lots to say there. And of course, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest member of the team, Dylan Anderson. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye also, the source is that it came to me in a dream, but I have a feeling that an Attack on Titan live-action adaptation is coming.